Ah, uh, you know what it is, man. Republic of Black Africa and Black Liberation Army leader, fighter, and political prisoner of 36 years in federal prison that I had the honor of meeting has passed July 6, 2023. Man, let me start this show, man. It's going to be emotional, man, you know. You know what it is. Unique Mecca Audio, man. This is what it is. This is what it is, man. I'm going to tell you like it is. I know I got a lot of haters. Gunshots to the haters. You know what I mean? And I know the haters don't like the gunshots because nine times out of ten, they ain't right. So that's why they don't like it. No disrespect to you. Just telling it what it is. But now, let me say this, man. Matula Shakur has passed. I'm going to give my eulogy. I'm going to give my Unique Mecca Audio gangster Eulogy to two cops, of course, stepfather, because he's the one that helped to raise me and a lot of us to shape us into the men that we became today. The man that you have talking to you today is the man that Matula, excuse me, Dr. Matula Shakur has helped to influence and change my life. So you understand that. I was an animal. I was a savage you know what I mean? I was vicious before I met Dr. Matula Shakur. The first time I met Dr. Matula Shakur, I'm going to give you my eulogy. All this fake, fake crap that's going to be out there. Everybody want to try and do this and that. I'm telling you because I had the pleasure of meeting this man. And that's why a lot of people that wasn't allowed to be in the presence of this man, because the universe knew that they was not cut like that. But men like us, this is how God works, man. This is how the universe works. This is how law works. This is how Buddha works. This is how Jehovah works. This is my Sunday sermon. This is how it works, so you understand. He puts us in front of those that we need to be in front of to be who he needs us to be. But he also gave us the will to be able to go left or right. I chose to go left. I'm not proud of that. But the universe brought me in front of Dr. Matula Shakur. And I became the man that I became today. See, a man like me, I'm going to keep it 100. You know, I feel, I, feel, I feel like giving you all the real. A man like me, all that they're going to have on TV and the hoopla and all of that, they'll never invite a gangster like me. When Matula Shakur touched me, but they don't want y'all to know that he was even associated with gangsters. They put him in jail to punish him. And his punishment turned to not only mine's, but Lou Sims' reward, you understand? Big Red's reward, Antonio White's reward, ER from DC reward, you understand what I'm saying? Boy George reward. Matula Shakur touched nothing but gangsters. They put all of us gangsters in one fishbowl, you understand? And they separated the weak. From out that fishbowl. I'm giving you all the real. It's not to bash nobody. I'm just telling you what federal prison is about. They separated the gangsters, killers, the niggas. That y'all don't like to use the N-word. So I apologize. But I'm just telling you like it is. They separated the niggas, man. And they put me in the category of an of a out-of-control Negro. Let me, check, let me change the, the, the narrative. But I want to just be me because I'm riding, man. It's my channel. So whoever don't like it, I'm going to give you three seconds to get the hell off because I'm getting ready to get serious. 
Now, let me get back to where I'm going. They went to punish Matula, Dr. Matula Shakur, and sent him in federal prison and gave that man, <laughs> you know, the amount of years that he lived. You know what I mean? They was waiting on him to leave in the pine box. From them doing that, you understand? It helped us to become who we are today, where I could sit on YouTube and talk to you as a respectable man, even though I'm raw, I'm gangster, I'm all that. I'm not even going to do no faking. You got President Obama, you got President Trump, you got President Reagan, you got President Bush, you know what I mean? And they say, you know what I mean? You know, ex-president, or they say president when they speak. Well, you're looking at, you know, a gangster slash ex-gangster, whatever you want to call it. So the people that want to say that this is supposed to be a eulogy and you're not supposed to talk that gangster talk, get off the channel. I'm going to give you three more seconds to get off my channel. All right, now let me begin. If you're still here, you want to be here. Now, so you understand. Then they grabbed us from the crack era and they threw us in this fishbowl. And they took a man... Uh, like Matula Shakur and put him around us thinking that he wouldn't survive when he thrived and raised us. Matula Shakur raised us, man, into the men. He had a hand in who we became. Now, my man, my man, uh, Kabe, a.k.a. Sean Boyd, official brother, I grew up with him, straight Gangster, whether he want to hear it or not. He's a gangster. We try and pull away from that because now he's, you know, rehabilitating the youth and he's going to Rikers Island speaking to the youth and he's involved in all types of programs to help rehabilitate the youth. This is my brother, a gangster. But now he's doing Matula Shakur's work. I'm going to let him speak so he could tell you the impact like, I shared some of mine because I ain't done yet because I'm riding, man. <laughs> Dr. Matula Shakur, the first time I met him was right after I got into it with the uh, C Cipher Power in Lewisburg, 1995. They took me to Oklahoma, shackled like an animal, like a, like a runaway slave, and I ain't never ran away from nothing. But that's how they had me shackled. Then they took me on an airplane in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and flew me to Oklahoma City to a big building, man. That looked like one of these skyscrapers behind us. Looked like the, the what's that? Uh, uh, the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty, whatever y'all call that behind me in the red. You know what I mean? Now, so you understand, the plane pulled up let's say to the Statue of Liberty and a tour mat comes out the Statue of Liberty and you go in and the whole inside of the Statue of Liberty is nothing but prison cells and holding cells and you know what I mean? They turned the, the Statue of Liberty into a prison. That's what they did with a building in Oklahoma and they take me in there. When I get off the joint, I spoke on this before, but I'm going to let y'all know. When I get off the plane, I'm walking down. They got me walking down like a duck. You know what I mean? I'm waddling like a duck. I get down there, they put me on a little wooden block, you know? So they put me on a wooden block, one police in front of me take off my shackles. See this, see this, see this joint on my wrist? They take them off. You understand? That's my shackles, you know? Then they go, and there's another one behind me, and he takes off, you know, the shackles on my feet. So when he got to the other foot, he tapped me on my leg because I was a little hesitant to take it up because I was stunned at what I was going through. He tapped me on my left ankle and said, Dad, a boy. <laughs> hey, yo, this is a white man in Oklahoma City that's spitting tobacco in a water bottle with sunflower seeds, tapped me on my ankle and said, Dad, a boy. You know what I mean? You already know what I did. You know what I mean? I'm upstairs. So now I'm upstairs. The next morning they come get me and... They put me on a big airplane with a bunch of other prisoners. When I get to um, Colorado, what was that? Florence, Colorado. I forgot the little town it was in because um, I was there. Yeah, Florence. Florence, Colorado. I get to Florence, Colorado, and some police, 
You know, we try, we, 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 we drive in a bus and we going down in a circle in a, in a bus, in a building. But this big bus is making around this little building. Uh, the building is so big that it's driving around the building in circles and going lower and lower and lower and lower. And welcome to ADX Supermax Florence where they have El Chapo, the Unabomber, Larry Hoover, uh, you know, King Blood, Pistol Pete. You know what I mean? This is where they took me, you know? Before Pistol Pete and El Chapo, but all the other men I named, I was there with them, check my record. The dudes that wasn't allowed in the gangsters areas don't like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they're ashamed to say who they was around. But that's just what it is. I'm just giving y'all the real. It's not to shoot no shots. Let's get this right. If I had something to say, I'd say, you know me, I never say nobody's name on my channel. I don't disrespect anybody. So if anybody go down that path, you know, that's them for whatever, you know, viewing reasons, meaning they're trying to get views. But it's not a problem, you know, but just don't use my name because I'm the only one eat from my bag because I'm the only one that sweat for my blood. So if anyone is in my description, use my content without my permission, even use my name without my permission, because I'm, I'm that smart that I trademark copyright my name. If you use my name, I will exercise my copyrights. You know what I mean? And shut you down. Now, let me get back to Matula Shakur. So I'm on a plane, you know, and we land in Florence, Colorado, and in comes, in the, in the, in the, in the plane comes Dr. Matula Shakur. When I got to Lewisburg a year before, I didn't know, you know, who he was. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't know who he was. But when I got there, everybody praised him that he was here, and they were telling me, yo, you, you know, unique, don't come here being too political, da 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 because I'm telling you, you know what I mean, these people don't get rid of you. They just got rid of Dr. Sakur because he was uniting all the young black guys to come together where we was all going to school and we were studying and taking GED and teaching each other. You know, he, had, he had us in, in Lewisburg teaching each other GED. The brothers that, that, that had GEDs in high school diplomas, he put together and had them educating the other younger brothers like me. I didn't want it. I, I wouldn't even, you know. But I'm, I'm just keeping it 100. That's where I was at at that time. It's like a lot of people watching this. They don't want to hear this crap. I know you don't want to hear this crap. You know what I mean? But you know it's so goddamn real, you're still sitting here, and you're going to think about it when you're laying down, screwing your girl, whatever you're doing. And yes, this is a eulogy. I say what I want because it's my channel, my eulogy. If you don't like it, I'm going to give three seconds to get the hell off my channel. All right, so let me get back to where I'm at. So now I'm in ADX Supermax. You know what I mean? They that because they transferred him to Marion, you know, at the time because ADX wasn't open up. Then they open up ADX and they sent him there, and then they sent me there, but they only sent him there for Marion to fill the bed space because they knew that he wasn't a problem. So they figured they could use him to bring him into jail so that the officers could learn and train how to deal with gangsters from a reformed political fighter so yes they used them you know but once we you know had the crack law riot in the BOP I'm gonna have to tell you all about that and really give it to y'all in chronicle order like a series because you know I like to mix my joints up because I don't want to bore y'all because you know some of y'all get bored with the real now we in the joint and in comes Dr. Shakur on the plane, and he sits down next to me. And he's telling me before I go, first thing he said to me is, what's your name? I said, Unique. He said, okay, Unique, listen, they're going to try and give you medication. That's the first thing out of his mouth. Yeah, I love him to death, man. I love him to death. Round of applause, Dr. Shakur. Yeah. 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 All right, all right, all right, relax. Now, Dr. Sakur said, Unique, they're going to try and give you medication. First word, they're going to try. Because that's how he talked to us. Like, you know, we kings. He, said, he didn't say they're going to give you medication. He said, they're going to try and give you medication. Refuse the medication under any circumstances. Don't take their medication. Because what they're going to try and do is me medicate you up and give you something that you like that you ain't even realizing that it's screwing you up, but it's going to screw you up because they know that you're too strong. He said, if they're sending you here to this prison... This is what he's telling me. I ain't even been there. I ain't even been in the system a year yet. 
I ain't been to federal system a year. I you know, like allegedly stabbed two police and I wound up in ADX. You know what I mean? And he's telling me if they sent you here, you know, they feel you extremely violent and they're going to find a way to undo your violence from up here. This is what he told me on a plane, you know? He said, don't let them give you no needles and tell you it's one thing or another. Dr. Shakur told me that. You know what I mean? He said, don't let them put nothing in your arm. He said, they come through the TB test, you could refuse it. And then they got to do an x-ray. But don't let them put no needles in you. Y'all was in the Federal Bureau of Prison know about that TB test every year that people willingly go up there and let them stick them, you know, with TB to see how they react to it, to see, you know, if they got TB because they got to give it to you to see if you got it type stuff. You know what I mean? So they had the TB test. Dr. Sikor said don't take it before I even got off the plane. I get off the plane, but I messed up. I'm going to keep it 100 because I don't do no whaling. On the way to Oklahoma, when I got to Oklahoma, they gave me a TB test. And I let them shoot me in my arm with the TB test. The next day when I get there, Dr. Shakur telling me, don't, don't let them give it to me. But they already gave it to me. So now I get off the bus. And when I get off the bus and get into, um, you know, after go down that long circle and we get down. This might be an hour, man. I just feel like riding. So y'all don't want to ride, get up on my channel. But now, after going down in that long little circle... And we get down to uh, 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 the basement. You had these big, big white boys. There wasn't even no black person there. I can't even say that they, they had house niggas. <laughs> you know what I mean? They didn't have any, you know? These were some big white boys. I mean, they, they, we call them corn fed because they look like a big piece of corn. <laughs> you know what I mean? Shoulders like this. Then they had on shoulder pads and riot gear and the big chest protecting the joint. They, they covering up their joints. You, you know, they had the knee pads, you know, steel toe boots. And there's about 10 of them lined up when I get off the bus. I'm going to keep it 100 because this is how gangsta I am. If you don't like it, that's on you. You know what I mean? They don't like this because a lot of dudes, no disrespect, you know what I mean? They, you know, they rolled over so they didn't put them through these type of penitentiaries, you know? When I get down there in ADX, I got the worst ass whooping of my life. I'm keeping it 100. I got the worst ass whooping of my life. From these goddamn corn fed white boys. I'm already angry. You know what I mean? The year before, they came and showed me pictures with my brother's head, you know, brains blown out on big 8 by 10 colored pictures that were so beautiful, like, like 15K. See my brother's brains blowed out on the ground and tried to break me that way. That's how serious this is. And a year later, I'm over here, and these big white boys is beating me. This is how I started my bid, man. So, you know, Alhamdulillah, I was blessed to start this at the beginning. So by the end, when I met Dr. Shakur, you know, I was able to, you know, reform and get myself together. And my judge felt that I did the right thing. You know what I mean? You know, I done, got, I done became a certified electrician, certified plumber, certified eight back in refrigeration, certified mechanic, culinary arts cook. I got 3,500 hours of psychological training. Oh, that is from Dr. Shakur. Because <laughs> Dr. Shakur, bad man. He turned a gangster into a scholar. And that's what I'm here to give him his props for today. He turned a gangster into a scholar. You understand? I didn't want to do a live on this because a lot of people is going to try and hate on you know, anything positive. But anyway, so they take me in the basement and they whoop me. They whoop me, they whoop me, they whoop me, they whoop me bad. I'm not even going to lie, they whoop me real bad. You know what I mean? And then after they whoop me, they pick me up and threw me in a cell, you know, in a cold concrete room with no mattress on it. Everything concrete. And got me laying there on the cold concrete floor. While I'm laying there on that cold concrete floor, I'm asking God, why are you doing this to me? I'm asking God, why are you doing this to me? You know? Then, before I got an answer, they came in. And this ain't no, this ain't no fairy tale. So this, I'm giving y'all the real what my life was like. They came in and they grabbed me and they picked me up and they 
take me in front of a doctor. You know what I mean? So they take me in front of a doctor, and the doctor said he has to give me a TB test. I told them I had one the night before in Oklahoma. They said, no, everyone coming on this institution have to give a TB test. I said, nah, I already had one. You can check it right here. You know what I mean? So then she said, oh, okay, let me check it. So she went to go check it. And when she went to go check it, you know, it was bruised up. You know what I mean? From where the police was fighting me at. So I'm telling them, and they're telling me, oh, it's it's red, it's X amount of centimeters, so this and that, so you got TB. I said, I ain't got no TB. I said, yeah, you got to get medication for TB. All I thought about was Dr. Shakur. I said, I'm not getting no medication for TB. I don't have TB. They said, no, it's swollen up, so it's positive. I said, y'all just whooped me. Gave me the worst ass whooping of my life. Of course, I fought back. So my arms got bruised up. And she said, well, we don't care. We got to give you a TB test. I said, well, I'm telling you, I'm not taking a TB test. I'm not even going to lie. You know what I mean? That police punched me dead in my chest. Boom. Knocked me clear to the other side of the room. And then they ran in and they grabbed me and they helped me down. And they trying to stick this needle in my arm. And I'm fighting them and I'm fighting them. And, you know, they, I mean, yo, we on the ground fighting over them trying to. It is an ADX. If y'all been to ADX of Marion, you know how it is. I don't know about in the, you know, nowadays. But when we went there when they first opened up, y'all that been in, the, you know, Marion and ADX back then know how they whooped you when they first came in. They give you the worst ass whooping in your life. So when dude told you he went there, he didn't get an ass whooping, he lied. You know what I mean? I'm telling you, you know? Oh, he was blessed. You say that. We're going to give him that out. He was blessed because they whooped me, and they whooped me bad. But anyway, so they take me up in this joint, and they beat me, and they beat me, and they're trying to stick this needle in my arm, and I'm fighting them off. I'm not going for it. I'm not going for nothing, damn it. They started stomping me on my head with their big boots. I'm on the ground. They stomping me on my head with their boots. But I'm not letting them put that needle in my arm because Dr. Shakur said so. And I trust my black doctor before I trust this government doctors. So they got tired of it. So they, you, 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 you know what I said? <laughs> you know what I, said? I got laughed. Y'all don't know, but I'm going to tell you why I'm laughing. I got laughed because, you know, when I say they got tired of it, right? I'm talking about they got tired of whooping my ass. <laughs> they get tired of me fighting back. You know what I mean? They got tired from whooping my ass. You know, I just kept fighting and fighting. And then one by one, they just, you know, leaned back on the wall and said, get them, Joe. <laughs> and they steady fighting. I'm steady fighting. I'm not letting them put nothing in my arm because Dr. Shakur said so. Another one go lean up on the wall. Then they all said, man, all right, let's take him upstairs. We'll deal with him tomorrow. They all out of shape, you know, because don't forget, I'm coming from Lewisburg, man. You know, a, a, a solid uh, about 10 months of working out. And I'm I'm. 29, just turn. Matter of fact, I just turned 30. But anyway, so, you know, they got tired, right? So they put me up there in the cell. And the doctor come and see me, and he, he trying to talk to me real nice, like I'm a psych patient. He asking me, can you sleep? Or you or you having runaway thoughts? You know what I mean? Um, what are them questions? Oh, you, uh, can you sleep? Or you having run, runaway thoughts? I have you contemplated suicide? You understand? Or, um, or you paranoid and feel like somebody's coming to get you? I said, y'all don't whoop me. Of course I'm paranoid you're going to come get me. You know what I mean? But I had to tell them, nah, I'm good. I had to show them my gangster. But I was scared to death. I said, man, when these white boys come back up in there and whoop me, man, I hope it ain't no time soon. But that's how they was down there. But other than that, with that first initiation when you come in, ADX, you know what I mean? The officers was all right, man, because they really was officers that screwed up in other joints, you know, like was under investigation for bringing in drugs or, you know, you know, whatever. But they lose their security points and they come to ADX to get their GS points back because they might have been a GS nine or GS eleven. You know, GS nine was like a cap, was like a, a lieutenant for GS nine. Same thing like in the military. So y'all put it in the comments. Y'all know better than me. So you know, you trolls and back bastards, go find somewhere else to go play with that. Y'all correct me in the channel, my mom. People that know, but it was a uh, G like GS nine. Was a, was a captain, uh, was a lieutenant. GS9 is a lieutenant. GS11 and 12 is a captain. 
that means they're capable of running a jail or a whole unit. You know what I mean? And the captain for the units was the unit manager. If a lot of y'all that was there didn't realize that the unit manager was in charge of security and everything and make sure the whole unit team was working properly. The unit team consists of the case manager, which is the one you go to when you want your PSI, which they don't give you. If they give it to you, they got to put it to you, put it in an envelope and send it out. Because I heard people say, oh, you know, I showed my PSI. No, they took the PSIs out in the late 2000s. You know, they said there was, it might even been, it wasn't in the 90s, but yeah, in, 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 in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, they took out the PSI. They took out the PSI because when dudes used to come on the compound, we tell them, go get your PSI from the case manager and come show it to us. And they go get their PSI, tell them I need to get my PSI. And as soon as you come to you, uh, the case managers normally have the PSI already printed up because they know that they're going to need it. So they don't wait till they come to stop to go do it. So when they come in, they put their folder together. They got everybody's PSI printed up, but they put it in their folder. If they come ask for it, they got it. If they don't, it's in their folder for when they do need it, when they get questioned, you know. Um, but that's how that is. So you understand. So this PSI. You know, you they took them out the system because that's how we check if somebody's hot. So now majority of the people that was coming in was hot. Or he cipher truth. Right? So majority of them is he cipher truth. So they come in and they trying to protect them and it's more of them. So they made a rule saying that the inmates wasn't allowed to get their PSI and their pos uh, and their possessions. You know what I mean? I think it was in the early 2000s. So y'all correct me if I'm wrong, you know? But I know they definitely, you know, took out the PSI. So when people say, oh, yeah, I showed my PSI, nah, nah. You know what I mean? You, if, if you had it hidden in your property or your people sneak it in and send it, then yeah, you'll be able to show it. But you're not going to go get it from the you, from the team. But you can get it from your lawyer, get it sent in, or you can have them send it to your lawyer and get it sent in so it can't get in. So if somebody... You know, say they came out last year and they showed their PSI to the homies. No, they're not lying because there's ways to get it. Because that's why they tell you to get it. You call home and they give you 30 days. If you ain't got it in 30 days, either you voluntarily walk up top or we're going to whoop that ass and send you up top. You know what I mean? And it's how we carry it. But, you know, Dr. Shakur sat me down and let me know, you need, you can't do that. Don't worry about that. They overpowering us now. I didn't realize it was changing like that. You know what I mean? Out here. You know? And Dr. Shakur, you know? Like over 20 years older than me. About 20-something years older than me. He taught me that. I didn't even know it was changing out here that the He Cypher Truth dudes was starting to take over. And he said, man, they ain't cut like us no more, man. You know? He said, you're always in the law library. You're working to go home. Don't go home and... Think that, you know what I mean? It's like it was. He said, man, if you think about doing anything, because, you know, um, I had stopped at the time at the time when he's talking to me, but it's like, like the way you was, you know, running around here slinging drugs in the joint and all that. He said, man, you think you're going to go out there and sling drugs? They're going to tell on you, man. He said, they're going to tell on you, tell on you quick, and then they homeboys is still going to embrace them back into the clique. I said, nah, never that. Never would the hood turn to that. He said, man, I'm telling you, you need. You know, he said, dudes going home now that testified against a lot of your homies. And when I call home, I'm finding out that these dudes got getting money and got all these people working for them. And they know that he's he's cipher truth. I said, never, doc. Never. He said, unique. That's what it is. And I still didn't believe. It. You know, I mean, I believed it to an extent, but I didn't think it was as deep as what I witnessed when I came home. My biggest transformation because, you know, I like to ride. My biggest transformation when I came home was seeing how the he cipher truth was able to be accepted. Like I said, I don't have anything against what a man do. I don't respect that, but I respect you for being who you are, which is he cipher truth. And, you know, if you don't have an issue with it, it's not a bad thing. If you have an issue with you, with it, then you're going to have an issue with somebody calling you it because you don't want to accept it. But I respect the men that accept that they hate to cipher truth. I can't hate you for that. Just like I can't hate, you know, the groundhog in my yard for being a groundhog. He showed me the groundhog. He tells me the groundhog. 
So if you tell me you he cipher truth, you know what I mean? I respect that. But now I know how to deal with you the same way I know how to deal with this groundhog. And it's not to disrespect you. I wouldn't disrespect the groundhog and I wouldn't disrespect you. I won't even put pellets out there to kill the groundhog. It's all about respecting people and God's creatures for who they are. And these are some of the things that Dr. Matula Shakur taught me. Because when I met him, I was on, man, kill all rats. That's where I was at when I met him. Man, we don't talk to rat, nothing to rat. We was on all that. And he had to explain to him, like, unique, they taking over. They spreading like wildflower. And then here it is. I come home, and not only are they spreading in the human form, they spreading in the, in, 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 in the rodent form. I'm on 8th Avenue at the Jamaican restaurant. There's rats everywhere. They not back in the day. A rat wouldn't come out when you when there's people out there. We sitting out there playing music. A rat wouldn't come out. Once in a while, you might see a hungry rat. You know what I mean? Run out there and try and grab a piece of bread and run back in. You know what I mean? I'm talking about the rodents. You know, what I'm just telling you about New York. I ride, man. So nobody take it personal. I'm just enjoying myself. No shots, no nothing. But anyway, so one might try and run out there and grab something. Hesitate, go back. Hesitate, go back. But in 2023, they just mm, and walk right in front of you. You know what I mean? Grab their little bread from off the sidewalk and back on the other side. I say that to say that even the road rats are taking over. So all the men that feel that they want to be in the game, when I'm telling them don't get involved in the game, it's not worth it. But there's rules and cloth cut for every level of life. If you think you cut from the cloth to deal with the crap that I chose to deal with that I'm telling you wasn't worth it. If you think that, if you think that, just know that when you get caught, I showed you how to play by the rules. Don't get caught and then want to tell on your comrade because I would never... Tell on my comrade. Because I would never do anything illegal with my comrade. You understand? And that's why I'm telling you, don't do anything illegal with your comrade. I did enough illegal with my comrade. And I went down for a lot of them. Came home, they all doing good, they successful, they doing better than I'm doing. And I love them to death. I'm not mad at nothing because I was blessed to meet Dr. Matula Shakur and who helped form me into the man that I am today. I'm just letting y'all know, man, that we have kings amongst us. I might do a live later on tonight about this. I just might do a live about this, you know? But, man, know that we here as a people. We here as a people, you know? Oh, here got the homie, um, Kabe, calling now. Kabe. Yo, what up, family? I was just getting ready to go off. I'm glad you called in time, son. Gay, what do you want to say about um, Dr. Matula Shakur, big bro? Well, first, peace and blessings be upon the brother. I'm, I'm sure that he's making a good home in paradise, man. But, you know, he's a staple of what we need, for, especially for the brothers in the struggle, brothers who's doing time, brothers who trying to be conscious of self. You know, I never had the opportunity to meet him personally, but I feel like I met him through so many other brothers. I used to hear how when brothers would come in the feds and if they landed a spot that he was in, how he would come, especially if he was from New York or Jersey, how he would come and, you know, educate you if anything you needed to know how the system was run. And he definitely would try to get you up in that law library. That was the first thing he would try to do. And, you know, the brother, he's, he's an example. We need brothers like that to mentor us, the younger brothers, the, the, as examples on how we should conduct ourselves as men, like you like to say, man time. He's a plain example of what it means to be on man time. And, and you know, a lot, from a law we come from into a law we return, man. I just... You know, hope brothers, you know, understand what he meant, not just for brothers on the inside, but the, the struggle and the principles that he that led him to be in the position that he was in. The brother never wavered, and he always stood on his principles, man. So, hum to the law. Mm. All right. All right. Now, you know, 
Tell them who you are, Kabe, and, and what you're doing right now to help the youth. Well, a lot of people know me as Kabe. My, my government name is Sean Boyd. Uh, I'm a black man out of Hackensack, New Jersey originally, but I, you know, I'm everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm doing, I served 30 years for a wrongful conviction of shooting a New York City cop back in 1989. I came home in 2019, hitting the ground running. Um, since I've been home, I founded two organizations. Um, one, I Am Black Innocent, which focuses mainly on the injustices of the criminal justice system. They're, they're especially the brothers who was convicted back in like the 80s at the height of the crack epidemic in the early 90s. There's a lot of brothers incarcerated throughout this country for crimes they didn't do. Not saying that they never committed crimes like myself because I definitely was in a criminal lifestyle, but it made it very easy for the uh, criminal justice system to convict me for crimes that I did not do. And it's a lot of us that fall under that same banner. So I try to put emphasis on that and educate the young brothers on how quickly that your life can get turned around or how you could be placed in the belly of the beast for a crime that you did not do. We try to educate the families and we try to give them resources, not just talk to them about it, but give them other alternatives and other resources because that's been the main problem a lot of times. Other things to do. So that's one. And then I got uh, an organization that we call GIFT, but it's Good Initiatives for Troubled Teens. And we focus, is, we focus on the youth. You know, I use other organizations to help funnel that, uh, such as Jumpstart, that's in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, I work with organizations such as Exodus, which was a mentor, a mentorship program for me that really helped me do this type of work that's based in East Harlem. And I'm now working for Fortune Society, which is in, which is based in Long Island City, Queens. Um, and I'm just out here doing the work. And I'm just out here trying my best to, to be an example. It's not always easy, you know, because as I'm trying to mentor and help other people, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. After 30 years, a lot has changed, not just within the technology, but the culture has changed. So I'm also working to make myself a better me while I'm trying to help and give the best input I can to the youth. Mm. Man, I, I, I'm I'm so 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 proud of my brother, man. I grew up with this brother, man. You know what I mean? We was the two wild young ones that, you know, left Jersey in the suburban areas to go over into the mean streets of New York from we was kids. You know, I go to jail in Trenton State Prison. I come like '85. I come back in like '87. Uh, when I come out in '87. You know, me and him out there together, I mean, and I'm talking about we grew up together from, like, grade school. We've been hearing about each other, but we didn't physically meet each other. Put on mute, uh, uh, Bear, please. You know, but we didn't physically meet each other. I'm talking about we was in grade school. And then as our lives went on and, you know, more people started moving out to Jersey and things like that from New York and... You know, maybe we just like they swag, whatever it was, you know what I mean? But, you know, for me, I was going over there to visit my family members. He might have been doing the same or going over on his own. But then I started going over on my own. And from going over there, you know, I fell in love with what I saw. And I felt more loved and embraced over there than I did over here. Because I was a little too aggressive for out here. They think I'm mean, I'm crazy, this and that. You know how that is. But, you know, I was different. You know what I mean? And so you can imagine what it was like growing up in school, being different like that. How if your peers can't, don't know how to deal with you, you know, could you imagine the teachers trying to know how to deal with you when you like that? So I never learned to read and write. What you got to say about that, Kyle Bear? Take it off from mute as far as about, you know, how did you wind up on the streets? Let me hear what you got to say. Well, I mean, I think it's a lot of different variables, but I just always been an adventurous guy. And, you know, being a little guy, I always felt that I had to prove myself. And I learned uh, at an early age, when you do the, you know, where I lack 
besides I, I added on with heart. So I would always do things that other people may have been afraid to do. Uh, if it was just jumping off roofs or doing things that the other guys may have been afraid, I would do it, take on the challenge. And, you know, as you get older, um, you start seeing the power that comes in with money. You see the influence that comes with money. And um, you see the influence that comes with violence. And um, a lot of times the violence implemented with, with the guns and things like that, or just doing violent acts. And you, I would see, like, when I would do these things, how people would talk about it the next day or talk about it, or I could go somewhere and people would know who I am based on what I was doing. And um, being, what, five, seven miles uh, from New York City, if that, you know, it wasn't that the things that, it, it really wasn't that, I didn't love where I was from because I did. It's just that it was more to do in New York. It was more room to do it. You know, where I was at, you may have done something and you have, you can stick out more. When I could come to New York, you had a bunch of dudes that was like that. So I could blend in more. I didn't have to worry about the law enforcement on me as much. I didn't have to worry about, you know, um, where every I can do one thing and everybody knew I did it. So... I start venturing out, and man, my um, it was like my brother. You know him. You may know him as Dude, my primary mm -hmm. chest. Mm -hmm. We start coming out to New York and doing what we do at an early age, and um, you know, I just enjoyed. I just enjoyed New York. It's not the same kind of New York now as it was mm -hmm. back then, but um, I just enjoyed it and got you know kind of caught up in the streets. Um, the things that the street bring. You know, when you're young, you think you know it all. You think you have all the answers at 18 and 19 years old. You, and, um, you know, it's hard. It's hard to listen or take advice from people at a young age when you don't really have the wisdom. You might have the knowledge to survive, but you really don't have the wisdom. So when people was coming to me trying to stir me in a different thing, I'm, I'm measuring them based on money. Well, look, I'm making more money than you. How are you going to tell me mm -hmm. what to do? And I'm basing it on power, what, what I consider power. And at that time, violence is what I considered as power, you know, being a, being a young man without wisdom. So, you know, it, it took time to get to where I'm at now. You know, going in the prison system, I basically, for my first 20 years inside the penitentiary, lived the same way I lived on the street. Coming from Jersey, I had to work a little harder to get established. I had to do things maybe a little bit more violent to get established, to get recognized. And once I did that, I wasn't really thinking about rehabilitating or getting out of prison because I had so much time. I just kind of accepted this is where I was going to be at. But thanks to the law, thanks to the creator, and thanks to a good support system, man, in time, I really got a chance to figure what this thing is about. And like they tell you, it, it seems like we live a long time, but actually our lifespan is only as fast as the blinking of an eye. So we, you know, we got to take it as we can and try to do the best that we can when we can. And that's where I'm at now. I try to, um, you know, like you, like other brothers, use my experiences, not necessarily to glorify, even though sometimes I have to give it in a certain way. Because like Malcolm said, sometimes you got to talk to the people in a language that they understand. You can't go to the bum on the corner or the alcoholic on the corner just talking about God. You don't want to hear that. You may have to take a sip of the alcohol with him to get his attention. So we got to learn how to come to the people in language that we under, where they understand. And that's what I'm trying to do now. Okay. Now, you just said that it was hard for you and you had to work harder and do things harder and more violent and more vicious while you was in prison, right? In New York State, yeah. That's what I wanted you to say. Tell them where you did prison and call out a couple of names. Let's give some of the prisons some shout-outs to our brothers we trying to get out up there, man. Tell them some of the places that you have been. Well, I, I, 
I've been everywhere. I, I started at a Max and I came home from a Max. I, I've been to Sing Sing. I've been to Greenhaven. I've been to Attica twice. I've been to Shawanga twice. I've been to Comstock, All Power. I've been basically, I've been to Southport Box like five times. I've been to all the major boxes. Comstock F1, B1, I, you know, Clinton, Unit 14, about three, four times. Mm -hmm. I've been... Every, everywhere you could think of that was live, that was doing something, because, again, I had knowledge, but I didn't have no wisdom. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I was taught, like, yo, okay, this is what you do to get your way up. The same way in the military, you do acts and you get strikes, you get medals. It's the same thing in the penitentiary. When you do certain acts and you do certain things, you get medals, but the medicals are not tangible medals, medals where now people know who you are. So, you know, you do things, sometimes you blow a motherfucker head off, excuse my language, you may just do it because you want to be recognized. You want to be, okay, yo, this is what so-and-so do. But the reality of it is fear that reenacts fear. A lot of people don't want to accept it like that, but actually that's what it is. You don't want something done to you, so you implement more violence so that things don't be done to you. Mm -hmm. All right, but I mean, I had I had great mentors, you know, Ron Do, Henry Pole, like any borough, anybody that was about something, I was under CMC, which is considered Central Monitoring case. Back then, seemed to be CMC, you had to have a very heavy case, or you had to catch a body on the island, or in some cases, an escape. It's a little different now, but all the heavy hitters from every borough, you know, with CMC. So as a young guy, I had the opportunity to, to be among Prince, to be among Paul Corley, uh, Big Nice, Big Crush out of Queens. I had, God bless, my brother just died, John Amante out of um, Brownsville, East New York, down with Baby Sam and uh, George Flewellen out of Harlem. Uh, Ron Do out of the Bronx. All these dudes was kind of like my mentors being a shorty among millionaires and heavy hitters. You know, I was no threat to them, so they kind of brought me in and showed me how when you go on the island, how to, you know, how you're going to have to have your oxes, you know, razors, and, you know, if you're traveling, you know, how to wrap that shit up and make you a case and wrap that shit up and put that shit in your ass while you're traveling in order to protect yourself and to survive. You know, these, you know, real shit. How, how to move. Mm. That's what it is, man. I mean, it was crazy. You know, it's crazy when I think about some of the things, but when, you, when you're trying to survive and you know you only got to depend on yourself to survive, you know, you, you, you could put me in a, a, a shoebox. Yeah, I might go crazy for the first 24 hours. I'm going to figure out how to survive while I'm in that shoebox. Okay. So that's my brother right there, man. Just letting you know that when I bring people up here, it's people that either stood tall or they're going to accept their responsibility the same as they did when they was in the courtroom. You know what I mean? So I'm not discriminating. I'm not on none of that. We just on just, you know, claim who you are. And where you at? Like my brother said, you know, and I was guilty of sin. So we're not up here trying to preach we know innocent brothers. And I broke a whole lot of law. My brother was innocent of the crime that they convicted of him because they railroaded him. And it was a New York City cop and they just wanted to close the case. So he was one of those brothers like the Central Park Five type. He fell during that time. And it wasn't the, it wasn't the newspapers. But, you know, they kind of pushed it on the rug because that's how they railroad us so that our, our peers don't know what they're doing to brothers like, you know, Kabir, a.k.a. Sean Boyd, you know. And I grew up with this man, you know. And I'm going to say this. He fight. You know what I mean? He fight. I grew up. All I kept. All I heard about. All I heard about uh, growing up. You know, out here in Jersey, 
when his name came up in Hackensack, hey, Sean Boyd knocked this one out. Sean Boyd did this. Sean Boyd did that. The same way they said, you know, Wayne and Peter did that over in Teaneck. Wayne and Peter did that over in Teaneck. And, you know what I mean? Because it, 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 it was a little area. But like he said, we was, we was mentally bigger than this area. And he said something I want to touch on, and I want him to get on it, too, if he feel like it. I just feel like riding because this is my Sunday sermon. He said that he had the knowledge, you know what I mean? But he didn't have the wisdom. He didn't have the, you know, he didn't know what it was. Is that what you said, um, Brother Kabir? Sure. You know? But not knowledge, knowledge is to know, but wisdom is when you apply it. You know, we know a lot of things be wrong, but we still do it. Because we don't understand the repercussion. Knowledge is to know how to move the piece. Wisdom is to know when you move the piece. What's going to come after you move the peace? Now, to add on to that. We know to move the peace, but when we don't have the wisdom, I know, yo, when we move that peace, this is what's going to come after that. Mm. In other words, he's saying cause and action, you know, a reaction to your action. You understand? And then when you have knowledge and you could wisdom, you know, what's to come, that's because you have understanding. Once you understand the transformation you went through, just like a caterpillar to a butterfly, then you'll be able to fly, you know what I mean? And soar like the wind and, you know, do as God intended you to do. But you have to get understanding, and that comes from having knowledge and wisdom. That's why they go in order, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And we could go into a whole joint where I'm going to let you know, just to give you a little mind teaser. You know, y'all put in the comments, you tell me now, you know, I say that knowledge and understanding is one and the same because you have to know it to be able to understand it. And you have to be able to, you know, understand it to know it, but it takes time to get to the understanding. But the understanding is the ultimate destination that we're trying to go. I might have lost some of y'all with that. You know, I'm going to say real slow and, you know, simple this time, you know. <laughs> Knowledge and understand is the same. Because once you know it, you know what I mean, then you must understand it. Because once you understand it, then you could wisdom it, meaning you could speak about it and you'll be able to avoid it. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how you wisdom it, like Brother Kabir said, being able to avoid it. But that's because you know it and you understand it. Right or wrong, Kabir, you want to add on to that, big bro? No, I think you pretty much got it, bro. Uh -huh. I pretty, you know, but I just, you know, we come into a time, man, you know, to me, things, is, you know, it's time for brothers to really get conscious to speak up. There's a lot of things going on in these streets, a lot of senseless shootings, a lot of senseless killings, and we're not seeing the Indians doing it. We're not seeing the Africans doing it. We're not seeing the Latinos, the the Hispanics, to the degree that we see the African Americans doing it with each other, and it's time for you know using these platforms to speak on that because it's getting real violent now. And the and the real sad thing about it is a lot of the the youth and the young men that's doing it, they don't even understand the the ramifications that's coming from it. Mm -hmm. This is why they fall, and you know they start. They get caught up and they telling every. It's almost like they never thought that this was gonna happen when they got caught. And we need to make them aware, yo, this shit is not a game, man. And you know, that we don't need to keep having these young brothers doing all this killing, and then you get knowledge yourself ten years after you in the penitentiary, or twenty years after. We need to give them the knowledge yourself now because the we 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 falling behind as a people. And all the other coaches is outplaying us. Listen, they man, listen. Listen, listen, this was... They're outplaying us power. Listen, Brother Kabir, this is what's going on. You understand? I'm going to break it down sublimely without saying any name, but y'all understand what I'm saying. We have these platforms. I got 58,000 people. I got 8,000 people in the last week, week and a half, something like that, because they like the content that I'm giving. I'm giving that real knowledge, and I'm actually enlightening, educating both young and old. Now... I'm 59 years old. When you get, and, and Kabir is about 54, 55. I don't know if he wants to say his name, if he wants uh, his I'm age. 57. 
Okay. okay. See what I'm saying? He's 57. I knew he was a couple of years younger than me. But, you know, because we was the young boys that was stupid out here in Jersey and we crossed the bridge and did what we did and became who we became. But I'm saying this to say that I have this platform. My platform is not to be up here talking crap about who had how much money in 88 and 78 and who had what car and, you know what I mean? And who owned what restaurant. I mean, that's stupid. How is that going to help the youth? If we're trying to help the youth, we have to give them wisdom like what me and Brother Kabe is doing. All that about, yeah, I got a ministry, but you know what I mean? Biggie had more money than Tupac. <laughs> what they got to do with saving the youth how much money Biggie and Tupac had? But this is the type of foolery that's going on, and I don't even pay no mind. And while they're busy watching what other people did 30 years ago, the world is moving past 30 years past them, and they still going to be back there wondering why everybody else elevated and they still stuck back here doing the same thing they're doing. I don't have time to watch another man's pocket or another man's lifestyle unless it's above mine's because that's where I'm trying to go. So I'm just trying to give the jewels and let you know I don't have no time to be talking about who did what and, you know, man trying to create whatever new narrative people is trying to create because you ask the streets, the streets know, and that's it. Like everybody know Brother Kabir on, 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 online, you know what I mean? That, 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 that's supposed to know him, let's say that. Because if you're not cut from that cloth, you're not going to know him. You would have heard of him, <laughs> you know what I mean? But you're not going to walk in the same footsteps that this man walked in, man. And I know he humble with it, and but I'm just letting you know this man seen hell. You heard those prisons in New York he said he'd been. You heard the names he said he was around. When he said those names, I got chills. No disrespect. I was already thinking, like, how the hell did he do that? I was like, damn, they're not dead. They're just incarcerated. That's what they did with us. They cut us off over there, and then people come on YouTube and talk about the people that's in jail and try to recreate the narrative and try to make the people that's in jail look like they wasn't nothing to make themselves out here look like they was something. Because to them, they think it's going to get them somewhere the same way a dude would go tell a girl that, oh, that's not really his car. He's driving car, his car. He ain't got no money. Give me the sex. I own my own car. He's driving Kabe's car. You know what I mean? That's what that sound like. I mean, this is some really, you know, but I love a dog ass crap. If y'all don't know what the love a dog is, and yeah, this is my ministry and this is how I'm preaching because I'm giving it to you real raw and uncut. This is for my gangsters and the people that want to know how gangsters move and how gangsters think because I'm thinking, talking to gangsters right now. Now, so you fully understand. You understand? Life is hard. We're going to make mis mistakes. We're going to bump our head. You know, I bumped my head, did 27, uh, 26. How much you bumped your head and did, Kabe? 30, and I was only home for eight. Remember, I just came from Anandale. I just did eight months. I just did two and a half. I was only home for eight months before I got trapped off with this. So I did the 30, and I just did two and a half before that. I was only home for eight months, man. So they took my youth, you know, in all my 20s. Basically, I, I left 19, came home at 22, got jammed up at 23, came home at 53. So I lost my 30s, my 40s, part Ooh. of my 20s, and a few years in my 50s, you know? Yo, my, yo. Seven now. Yo, you listen. I got no choice because you know the old saying, I know you heard it, Kyle Bear, you know, too much sunlight burns the plant and too much water drowns the plant. You heard that before, right? Sure. Okay, sure. so the point being is, this is where we got to tap out because we don't want to burn them and we don't want to drown them. You, yo, you went in and you lost. Tell them again the years of your life you lost from your bad choices and getting railroaded. <laughs> I went in at eighty in that nineteen eighty six. That's when I went down. We crossed bridges. I went down Annandale, Stokes Forest, High Point. I came home eighty eight. They trapped me off, I was moving fast. You know, I was getting to the back real fast. They trapped me off in New York after eight months. And I ended up doing the 30 over here. You see? Come on, man. Eight months and then doing 30 years. Yo, we gonna tap out. Thanks for tapping in, uh, big bro. That was an hour, so they got more than enough. All right, you wanna say something to the people? Man. 
No, nah, salute. I just, you know, keep the struggle alive, man. And all the fellas on lockdown, man, we got to keep them in our minds. Even if we can't reach out to them with money and help support them financially, just sometimes just send, send a brother behind the wall a good word. Let them know you're thinking about them, mm. you know? All right. All right, one. Y'all, right. y'all enjoy right. yourselves, man. All right. Cheers, cheers. Toast the crime, the crime, the crime, the crime, the crime. Hold it. Can of 26, yeah. he back on the strip, uh-huh. getting back in the mix. Yeah. What he mentions a gift. Trust. You stand up ten toes down, and I suggest you pay attention to this. Real. Take a little gully, posse, and put it in home. Uh-huh. He cut from the bottom, back. came up from the bottom. Back. Drop the book, you should go and get it. Go An Instagram it. page and a YouTube, you could go and visit. Yeah. Then you could consider yourself LinkedIn. Real. Sit front row and get juice from a kingpin. Uh-huh. How he went through it, so you ain't gotta go do it. Uh-huh. Did not pay attention would be stupid. stupid. Talking about a man. That probably put your grandfather on Probably the reason that him and your grams got along A man that generated millions on the block Did his time, never squilling to the cops Make an audio Get, get it live like two G's in the night. Yeah. Drop top beamer so shine. Yeah. I let shorty go, she was wine. wine. Treat her like my past, she behind me. What? Spin a couple bands on the dapper dan. You be back again, getting green like a Packers fan. No cap, this a roaring uptown. Yeah. Baby horn uptown, Dominican bust downs. Now we on the positive. You we got a lot to give. Yes. Now you trying to stop the kids from being inoperative. Uh. So take heed, homie, lend the air. Uh. He started in uptown, he gon' finish dead. Uptown, but now uptown. it ain't about selling drugs, buying cars. It's nope. about buying property to make the community ours. Back. So we can give back to the youth them. Uh. Cause they the truth them. Uh-huh. And bless up to all the rude men. Yeah. Cheers, cheers, the crime, 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 the Yes, you pay attention to this. Real. Take a little gully posse and put it in home. Uh, he cut from the bottom, back. came up from the bottom. Back. Drop the book, you should go and get it. Go An Instagram it. page and a YouTube, you could go and visit. Yeah. Then you could consider yourself LinkedIn. Real. Sit front row and get juice from a kingpin. Uh, How he went through it, so you ain't gotta go do it. Uh-huh. Did not pay attention would be stupid. Talking about a man that probably put your grandfather on. Need probably it. the reason that him and your grams got along. A man that generated millions on the block. Uh-huh. It's time, never squilling to the cops, make an audio.
get, get it live like two G's in the ninth. Yeah. Drop top beamer so shine. Yeah. I let shorty go, she was wine. Treat her like my past, she behind me. Spin a couple bands on the dapper dan. You be back again, getting green like a Packers fan. No cap, this a roaring uptown. Baby horn uptown, Dominican bust downs. Now we on the positive. You we got a lot to give. Now you trying to stop the kids from being inoperative. So take heed, homie, lend the air. He started in uptown, he gon' finish dead. But now it ain't about selling drugs, buying cars. It's about buying property to make the community yard. So we can give back to the youth them. Cause they the truth them. And bless up to all the rude men. Yeah.